If you look, if you look at your bulletin, I'm Carolyn Poteet. <laughs> no, I was, my name is Kevin Gorley, retired from uh, Memorial Park Church in Allison Park, north of uh, Pittsburgh. But I was in Frick Park yesterday hiking with my wife, and I uh, got a text, got a call from Carolyn, who said, I think I've got the stomach flu. Can you come and preach for me? And I said, yeah, sure. I'm, you know, obviously I'm, I don't have time to prepare a sermon, so I'll probably preach from my files. I preached at uh, Cop United Presbyterian Church in uh, Chippewa. I always call it Chipotle. Uh, <laughs> but I like the Brighton hot dog there. Um, but I preached there last week, and I thought it would fit into World Communion Sunday uh, this week. But before I start, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, North Carolina, uh, missionary parents in South America. Actually, I was born in uh, South America. And um, I've been at Memorial Park uh, for 34 years. I came there originally for about five years and then uh, thought I might have my own church, but God had a different calling in my life. And I was there as, uh, for the pastoral care uh, position for boy, 34 years, and I retired about a year and a half ago. Uh, my wife is here to uh, support me. Since I've been uh, retired, uh, sometimes on Sunday morning she says, um, you know, she kicks me, time to get up for church. And I say, I don't want to go to church, I'm retired. <laughs> and she says, uh, yeah, but you're preaching this morning. So um, I got up. Um, but um, I've been married to uh, Betsy for 38 years. She was born in Pittsburgh, was raised at Memorial Park Church, and I met her in Atlanta when I was at Columbia Theological Seminary. And of all places, I'd never been to Pittsburgh in my life. I ended up back here, and uh, this is my home. I've got two sons, uh, John Hunter, who is a financial advisor with First Command, I think some people in the church use him as a financial advisor. That's why I'm retired now, because he set me straight. Um, and then I've got another son, Evan, who uh, graduated from uh, Princeton Theological Seminary about a year ago, uh, but he decided to go into teaching. He's uh, teaching uh, in the inner city of Philadelphia as a, as a teacher and uh, uh, probably a baseball coach. So that's God's call on his life. We've got uh, five grandchildren, and an uh, interesting little fact is that uh, our stated clerk for the EPC, you probably know is Dean Weaver, my, all, my two sons married his two daughters. Uh, so we share all grandchildren together, and uh, we're quite a, quite a family, a, a large family. He's got six kids, and um, I've got, no, he's got seven kids now. Yeah, seven. And um, I've got two. So we have the same grandchildren. This church means a lot to me. Uh, three of my most beloved mentors uh, were in this church, Dr. Larry Selig. How many of you remember Larry? Uh, he was here. He was like an pa uh, associate pastor here for a really long time. I met him in 1984 at the General Assembly and he set me straight about the Holy Spirit and Reformed theology, and both those work together. Um, and then uh, Dr. Bruce Bickle was our interim pastor. I think he was the interim pastor here for a while. Um, and, and he became a great mentor. I'm gonna talk about him later on in the sermon. And then Bob Jamison. Is Bob here this morning? Bob and I have been praying together for 30, 34, 35 years for revival in the city and revival in the church. And uh, Bob is a, is a real leader and a member of this church. So before I uh, go into scripture, I'd like to pause just for a silent prayer of meditation as we prepare our hearts and minds for the reading of scripture. Let's pray silently together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Open our eyes that we might see, 
wonderful things from your word this morning. For it's in Jesus' name and only through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture, if you want to look with me, we're going to uh, Philippians chapter 4, and I'll be talking about the uh, gift, uh, the essentials of, really the six essentials that I find in the scripture of contentment. And and I think contentment is, is a real important thing to talk about World Communion Sunday. In chapter 4 of Philippians, starting at verse uh, 10, and let me, let me set this up for you. Paul is a prisoner in Rome. He's under house arrest now. He's been arrested, even as a Roman citizen, to stand trial in Rome on charges that have been brought to the, to the Roman government. Um, in house arrest, you were usually chained to another guard. Now, I like fellowship, but that's a little bit too close uh, for me. Chain, can you imagine being chained uh, constantly? He was chained. Um, uh, some scholars believe that he knew of his imminent execution or beheading coming up. And others think that he, because he was a Roman citizen, he thought he would be freed eventually and would be able to go to the uttermost of the world at that point, Spain, to share the gospel. Now, He loved the Philippian church. He had planted the Philippian church on his second missionary journey. And his first convert was Lydia, who was by the river, and they formed the church. Uh, Scholars say he was probably there three to six months teaching and preaching. But this church was very, very special to him. I've served three churches, and because I served Memorial Park so long, that is a, a, a very special church to me. And they were ministering to him through communication, through letters, through gifts. And they sent Epaphroditus as a, as a leader of the church to come and minister to him and give fellowship to him and visit with him. So he's writing this from his home arrest in Rome to the Philippians. And even in his situation of being in house arrest, possible uh, execution in the future that he, he might have been aware of, He writes this to them. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, and this is the key. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This is from the ESV, and uh, this is an important Bible to me because Bruce Bickle gave it to me. So um, I'm reading from the ESV today. Now let's evaluate ourselves in terms of our contentment. And I wanna ask three questions. Uh, The first one is this. If you come upon yourself, usually every day, in the mirror, What do you see? What changes might you make? We all have to deal with this over and over again. You know, if we evaluate our contentment, we have to evaluate uh, how we think about ourselves. And I want us to, I want to remind you of a great passage out of Ephesians 2.10 which says, you are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared in advance for you to walk into. You and I are God's masterpiece no matter what you see in the mirror. Masterpiece comes from the Greek word poeme, which means poem. God don't make no junk. You and I are children of God. He loves us. And we are to love ourselves and feel forgiven because we need forgiveness, we need repentance, we need confession, but we need forgiveness. The second question is this. 
Do you have a friend or acquaintance and he or she has something that you don't have and you desire it? What might that be? And then the third question is this. Do you have a friend or acquaintance who has been congratulated for something or received a reward for something and, or was written up in a paper and you saw it and what was your reaction? Were you thankful for him or her or were you jealous? Little three questions to evaluate our own contentment and our own circumstances. I think it's also helpful to think about people in your life who have that gift of contentment. They are content no matter what their circumstances are, and Paul was. We're gonna read a little bit more about him and some cross-references, but since I'm preaching here this morning, I think about Bruce Bickle. You know, Bruce was a stud. He was a star. Graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Before he went to the U.S. Naval Academy, he was a, a draft pick of the Baltimore Orioles, their first pick to play shortstop or second base. I had to drag all this out of him because I'm such a sports fanatic. He was also one of the first uh, recruits, a guy named Dean Smith, uh, the longtime coach of the Tar Heels, wanted him to play point guard for them starting in 62, 63. He passed that up. And he went to Navy on a, an assignment and was Roger Staubach's backup quarterback at Navy. Roger Staubach got the Heisman, I think, in 64. And then Bruce took over after that and I think led them to the Cotton Bowl or something like that. So he was a stud. He was a star. Then he married, uh, I think it was Mrs. Kansas or Miss Kansas. It wasn't Mrs. because she wasn't married yet. But Miss Kansas... Uh, that didn't work out um, over time, and he got married to Becky. But he was a, a Navy pilot in Vietnam, was shot down, broke his back, both of his legs. He's had about 11 or 12 surgeries since then. He's been in constant pain. And because part of his mission was flown through Agent Orange, one of the side effects of Agent Orange is Parkinson's disease. And now he's, um, he, he's not bedridden at this point, but he's in a wheelchair. He can't use his hands, can barely feed himself, has PT about three times a week. I see him about once a month. He's in constant pain from his back surgeries, but he is a man of deep, deep contentment. He can't even pick up a Bible anymore. But what does he do all day? He listens to scripture and he prays. He also watches a lot of sports <laughs> because he, he just loves sports like I do. But he spends a lot of time in prayer and reading scripture and he's deeply, deeply content. And that speaks to me. Because his circumstances are a lot different than my circumstances. And yet he's surrounded, he's surrounded by fellowship. And you know, he's homebound. He's under house arrest, really. Just like Paul, and he suffered greatly. And sometimes some of the most content people I know have suffered greatly. And it's through that suffering that they've come face to face with God and found that he is enough. And that's all we need. And I, and I just briefly, before we go into communion, I wanna talk about six essentials that I see in this scripture or through the scripture that I think applies to us today about Paul's life and what we see in Paul's life. I want us to look at verse 10. Paul says this, <coughs> I rejoice in the Lord greatly that you have revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, for me, but you had no opportunity. He says, I rejoiced. All these uh, six essentials I want to uh, bring to your attention all start with a C. And the first one is celebration. Celebration despite 
our circumstances. Rejoice. He says earlier in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always, my friend. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto men, for the Lord is coming again. Yes, the Lord is coming again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And what happens? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What's the, re what's the result of rejoicing in all circumstances? The peace of God. Do we feel like rejoicing? I don't. You know, if you think about your day, what's the hardest part of your day? For me, it's waking up. <laughs> I remember when I was in high school, first words out of my mouth when I was waking up was, I hate school. I, you know, I just didn't want to get up. I, th I thought when I retired, I'd be able to sleep in. I can't do it. <laughs> My wife's up at 5, 5.15. I'm up by 6, 6.30, and, I, and I'm retired. I can't sleep in. Somebody said this. The first eight minutes of your day will color the attitude of the rest of your day. The first eight minutes. I read that uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was really convicted about that. And, and instead of griping and complaining and trying to get out of bed and my back and I'm sore and trying to praise God. Praise God for your thankful, thankfulness for, for answered prayer, his character, understanding his character and praising his character despite what your, your uh, challenging circumstances must be. Celebration. How do we celebrate? We celebrate personally. And we also get into the routine of coming to church, not once a month, not twice a month, not every once in a while, not during Christmas or Easter, but try to get there every Sunday because part of, of Sunday worship is worshiping God together and singing together. I like the hymns. I like the new, the new stuff that, that we sing. I like all kinds of music. And being together in a body is so important. Tonight, Betsy and I are I'm glad the Steelers are playing at 820 uh, tonight. But we're going to a, a service of hymn sing tonight at a, at a local church. And we're really looking forward uh, to that and singing the old hymns together as a body of Christ. Celebration. You want more contentment? Praise God. Rejoice. Again, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. That's a commandment. It's a commandment. The second thing I see in the scripture is that Paul didn't compare himself or his circumstances to anyone else. He didn't compare. Look at the second question. Have you recently sen seen something you did not have that you desired? Not comparing ourselves with other people. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this, and I quote, you will never have enough until you get Christ. But when you have Christ, you will be full to the brim. Do you have Christ in your life? Is Christ your co-captain or your master? Have you made a commitment to Christ? I was in church all my life, brought up by missionary parents, a fourth generation of preachers. I didn't know Christ. I knew a lot about him. I went to church every Sunday. I colored the bulletin, and you know, I didn't pay attention to anything. But then when I was 17 or 18, someone led me to Christ using one of those uh, uh, four, the, the Campus Crusade track. And I was born again, and I was a Christian. And things changed. 
You know, when, when Christ is in your life and gaining more and more control of your life, do you notice how simple your life becomes? I don't need that Cadillac. I don't need that big home. I don't need that second home. I don't need to travel around the world. I don't need to have success. I'm successful because I'm a child in Christ. I know him and that's enough. Because what comparing does is lead to the third C that we don't see Paul doing is coveting. Thou shalt not covet, that's one of the big 10. And it's interesting how when, when Moses uh, received the Ten Commandments from God, this was an agrarian society, and he said, thou shalt not covet. If you look at the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not covet another's wife or, or their oxen or their donkey or their cattle or, their, or whatever it is. I don't covet another person's wife. I'm in a life group and uh, know a lot of couples, and I'm glad I'm not married to them. <laughs> they're probably glad they're not married to me. That's one thing I don't covet. I'm, I'm glad I got, I got her. Oh, my gosh, would I be lost without my wife? What do we covet? If we have Christ as Lord of our lives, our life becomes more simple. We don't need all these things that the world says. Because when we covet, we have our eyes on the ways of the world. God will give us all we need and even more if we put our trust in him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added to you. To covet. So, Paul celebrates, he doesn't compare, he doesn't covet, and he doesn't control. He has no control now. Paul is under house arrest. He had given up all control, but now he really doesn't have any control. Can you, be a, a, you know, imagine being chained to someone and having to go to the bathroom and you have no privacy? He had, he had no control, and we don't either, but God does. God is a sovereign God. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his plan because God is even in control. We can even covet other spiritual gifts. I was called to preach and teach and, and mostly uh, give spiritual care to those who are dying or hurting. And I, I've got to be honest with you, sometimes I hear other people preach. I was at a church, uh, Memorial Park, where great preachers have been there. Bruce Bickle, Doug Pratt, Dean Weaver, and now we've got a young guy, Chris Etuff. Man, they can preach. And when I hear them preach, I never want to get in the, in the pulpit again because I'm comparing. Do we think we have control? How many of you have been through this? Um, I lost my wallet the other day. Have any of you seen it? <laughs> you talk about feeling like you've lost control. I mean, I never had any money in my life. This is one time I had $300 in my wallet. I thought I was rich. And I wanted the banker to give it to me all in one so it was you know, really thick like I'm <laughs> some kind of drug dealer or something. You know? um, and, and I don't know where I put it. I, sp I spent 24 hours looking thick and thin at my son's house, our house, and our cars. I cannot find it. It's got my Medicare card in it, my credit card, my banking card, my license, uh, my BJ's uh, uh, gas card. It's got everything in there. And I'm just praying that somehow it's magically going to show up. I even went through the trash. You know, I was out in my yard yesterday morning, trash all over the place going through it. They probably thought I'd lost my mind. But I realized I don't have control. Even if I had my wallet, I don't have control. Praise God that there's a king that does have control. 
and he loves me and, and, and he has my, my goodness and, and your goodness in mind. So Paul, he celebrated. He didn't compare, he didn't covet. He gave up all control. He was, un, you know, housebound. And the thing about Paul is that he confessed his weakness. Are you open? Are you transparent? Are you real? That doesn't mean when you're in church and somebody comes out, how are you doing? And you just start spilling your guts all over the place. And, the, and then they see and they don't want to say how you're doing anymore. Um, <laughs> But do you, do, you, do you confess your weakness? I, I love it when, when Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, verses 8 through 10 talks about his weaknesses. He says, so to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said, and you know this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. And I will boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ might rest upon you. You know where the the power of Christ comes into your life? It's through your weaknesses, confessing your weaknesses. I had a friend that was um, down at the uh, art show in Pittsburgh years and years ago, and she was really into pottery and and looking at at all this pottery they had on display, and she came upon this this real ugly uh, pot that had all these cracks in it, and and the guy wanted a lot of money for it, and she said, uh, you know, why why so much money? This this is not not a very good-looking pie. It looks like he messed up. He said, well, let me show you something. He got a candle, and he put the candle in the middle of the pot. He lit it, and then the light came through all the cracks. And it was a beautiful, beautiful pot. That's the way it is for us. You want to lead someone to Christ? Do you want to learn how to evangelize? Tell a story and tell the story how God has met you in the broken places of your life or how he continues to meet you in the broken places of your life. Confess your weaknesses. That's where the power of Christ resides. I tell you, I've, I've, I've dealt with uh, depression all my life. Anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and I've pleaded with God to heal me. And he's found ways to heal me through medication, through counseling, through therapy. I discovered my mother died when I was born. And that's where a lot of this abandonment feeling came. But I found out that it's through my weaknesses that I had a ministry called pastoral care because what I what I'd been through. First time I was ever anointed was in this church. Years ago, you had a a healing team here. I think it was 91. Larry invited me to come. And then he invited all the pastors up uh, and gave them anointing oil and said, now when people come up for you to pray, I want you to pray, you know, anoint them with oil and pray for them and and see how the Lord wants to heal them. And And I was up right here and I looked over and a guy anointed somebody and, and so I did the same thing and when I did it, uh, this guy that, that had a bad shoulder and his wife kind of helped him hobble up, he fell down. I thought I'd killed him. Dragged him right over there, and he started moving his arm, and he said, I'm healed. I don't have any pain. And I, you know what my first words were? I don't believe it. <laughs> but God didn't do that to me. Continued to struggle. Struggle sometimes today. Retirement helps. But it's through your weakness that God has power. And then finally, I want to talk as uh, we go through, uh, get ready for uh, communion, is community. Look at verse 11. 
Paul says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content because of your concern for me. Paul was in a community. He developed community around him through his weakness in preaching the gospel, which is the weakness of Christ on a cross, and inviting people who believed as he believed to gather around and form community. What would you and I do without the church? What would you and I do if we didn't have people praying for us in the challenges of our lives? I can't, I can't understand how people make it if they don't have a community or they don't have a church where the power of God resides. I retired, um, as I said, a year and a half ago, and we felt like it was necessary after my long uh, tenure at Memorial Park for us to leave, leave for about a year, a year and a half to, for, for the person who came to replace me, uh, to have freedom to do what she felt called to do in the church. And now we, uh, now we are starting to return to, to our church. But we retained our, our time in what I call, call our small group or our life group. We meet every week. We need to meet every week. Sometimes we can't make it or other people can't make it, but we at least meet. And we usually discuss the sermon on Sunday and we have prayer needs or we just have fellowship time. And throughout the week, there are constant emails and texts going back and forth of something that can be prayed for in our life group. We've been through challenges together. We've been very vulnerable and open with our challenges, and we feel the prayers of the people. There's nothing like a life group, a prayer group, but there's nothing like a church. It's interesting. We're starting to go back to church. We have three services on a Sunday, and I was there a couple weeks ago. And I, and I walked in and greeted someone, and he said, uh, are you, have you been visiting with us? <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know I, my name is so-and-so. Uh, he didn't even know who I was, which was so refreshing, you know, because there's so many newer people that, that are coming in. Um, and of course, I didn't want to say, well, I was a pastor here for 34 years. Who are you? Um, but we gather together with the assembly of God's people to hear the word of God taught and preached and to sing God's praises and to pray together. It's so important that we have community. So where is your contentment today? What circumstances do you find yourself in? Paul said this. He said, oh, I forgot what he said. Um, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Have you made your peace with God? Is Christ enough? Do you have the fellowship that you need in the local church? Have you made a commitment to Christ? It's so important that you do that and recommit your lives even today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how we read about contentment in your holy word. And I admit, I, I really struggle with that. We all do, Lord. But through the circumstances of this scripture and looking at Paul's life, we see certain essentials, Lord. We pray that we would celebrate your goodness and praise. We pray that we would not compare uh, and covet what others have, but thank you for, for all that you have given us that we don't deserve. Lord, we give up control today of our wallets, of everything we have. We give up control to you. We confess our weakness. Lord, use our weaknesses to share the faith with others. And Lord, thank you for community. Continue to pray for this church and the needs of this church, and thank you for this church. We pray for Carolyn. Thank you for her leadership and as well as the session's leadership here, and we uh, pray for your blessings and your health upon her. And Lord, prepare us for holy communion as we stand to confess in faith the Apostles' Creed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand with me as we say what we believe?
together. Using the Apostles' Creed, it's probably, yeah, it's up there and it's in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.